Jennifer Martiner, and I'm pleased to welcome you to today's NDI Checkpoint Web Conference. In this program, we address audit committee updates, revenue recognition, related party transactions, executive compensation, and internal controls. Before I turn the presentation over to our speakers, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. Today's program will last approximately one hour, followed by a short question and answer session. We encourage you to submit written questions during the program. Please type your question into the Q&A widget open on the left-hand side of your screen. We will respond to written questions at the end of the program, time permitting. The webcast console you are looking at can be completely customized. You can resize or move any of the windows that you have open, including maximizing the PowerPoint presentation on your screen. If you experience technical difficulties during the presentation, please visit the webcast help guide by clicking on the help widget below the presentation window, which is, which is designated with a question mark icon. The PowerPoint presentation will be available on our website at foley.com in the next few days or you can download a copy of the slides and additional resources in the resource list widget. As a reminder, today's program is being recorded and will also be available on Foley's website in the next few days. Foley will apply for CLE credit after the web conference. If you did not supply your CLE information upon registration, please email it to Haley Musgrave at hmusgrave at foley.com. To be eligible for CLE, you will need to log into the On24 session and answer a polling question during the program. Please note, certificates of attendance will be distributed to eligible participants approximately eight weeks after the web conference via email. As a final note, those seeking Kansas, New York, and New Jersey CLE credit are required to complete the attorney affirmation form in addition to the polling question that will, be dur that will appear during the program. Enter the five-digit code that will be announced during the presentation on the form and return the form to Haley Musgrave immediately following the program. And now I would like to turn the presentation over to Frank. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Frank Burke. I'm a partner at Foley & Lardner. I am a litigator by trade, um, handling uh, securities litigation and breach of fiduciary duty cases involving companies uh, audit committee members and auditing firms, and also engage in counseling activity with our corporate partners on uh, litigation assessment and the like. So I'll be the legal guy on the panel, and uh, Jennifer Cavanaugh, uh, a partner from Grant Thornton in the Chicago office, uh, will cover the auditing, uh, the auditor uh, side of the, of, the rep of the presentation today. Uh, she's a graduate of the Kelly School of Business at Indiana University and is the professional standards partner in the Chicago office as well as a full-time audit partner. Um, Mark Zorko is with us today. Uh, Mark is a uh, uh, audit committee member and chair of, uh, of at least one audit committee. Uh, he's a graduate of The Ohio State University, where he has his accounting degree and his MBA in IT from the University of Minnesota. He's been involved in uh, uh, multiple roles in corporate America, uh, CFO, CIO, Board of Directors member, Compensation Committee member, Governance Committee member, and Audit Committee uh, member and chairing several uh, audit committees. So the general framework of the panel will be, uh, we'll work through three topics today. Um, the first one will be revenue recognition and the new uh, uh, rule that's coming into play. The second will, one will be related party transactions and kind of a retrospective on the new uh, audit standard on, rev on related parties that was promulgated by the PCAOB and came into effect this uh, audit cycle. And lastly, uh, uh, some internal controls uh, discussion. And uh, so we'll uh, try to intersperse as much panel uh, discussion as we can after every couple of slides just to keep it interesting. Um, so Haley, why don't we go to the first slide? So in terms of uh, why is revenue recognition important, uh, 
45% of the SEC in enforce, uh, enforcement and private litigation accounting fraud cases involve revenue recognition issues. Um, some examples are shown on the slide. I won't read this uh, verbatim. Uh, they're familiar topics, timing, earned, earnings management, fictitious sales, uh, channel stuffing, bill and holes and the like, fraudulent parking transactions, off-balance sheet transactions, and asset inventory, uh, receivables valuation impairment issues. So let's go to the next slide, Haley. So this slide is primarily derived from a speech that the uh, SEC Director of Enforcement gave in January. Um, the historical perspective is that from the Arthur Leverett uh, famous speech in 1998 through the beginning of the financial crisis, uh, accounting fraud and revenue recognition issues were very, very high on the SEC agenda. In the wake of the financial crisis, uh, they diverted a lot of resources uh, towards dealing with the financial crisis, which typically didn't uh, involve revenue recognition issues. And in 2013, when a new chair, uh, Mary Jo White, and a new director of enforcement, Andrew Ceresny, both of whom uh, had prosecutorial and Wall Street uh, experience, came on board, they felt that they needed to redevote uh, uh, resources at the Commission towards financial reporting uh, and auditing. And so they created a task force in 2013, um, and it was changed to a group recently. And uh, so Andrew, in his speech, identified a series of topics that they felt that they were going to focus on, uh, revenue recognition, valuation and impairment, earnings management, missing or insufficient disclosure, which typically can involve, they're very interested in executive perks these days, uh, which haven't been disclosed, and also related party transactions. Uh, they have a very strong emphasis on internal accounting controls, and they're very interested in using the power that they were given under the Sarbanes-Oxley statute to claw back uh, bonuses and incentive-based compensation uh, in the event of restatements. Andrew gave... Uh, a strong uh, presentation on the importance of accountants, audit committees, uh, especially audit committee chairs and auditors as gatekeepers. And to reinforce his point, he mentioned uh, three matters in 2014 and 15 where audit committee chairs uh, were personally named in uh, some enforcement proceedings. Uh, one was Ag Feed Industries, one was L&L &L Energy, and one was Muscle Farm. Some of the facts of these cases are fairly egregious. Uh, I think in one case they submitted a fraudulent uh, CFO certificate electronically signed by a person who uh, was offered the position but never accepted it. So that's the level that they're dealing with in terms of enforcement activity. Um, they've He emphasized that they really expect audit committees and auditors to ask for objective evidence do internal investigations when they need to, and uh, the importance of the national office of the auditing firms getting involved uh, when they get a heavy pushback. Um, he specifically mentioned that uh, when an audit committee learns of material inaccuracies, uh, they have to take concrete steps to learn all the relevant facts and cease annual and quarterly filings until they're satisfied with the accuracy of the financial statements. So they've uh, they've got a, a couple of different ways that they're generating leads. Um, they have uh, an economics uh, component at the SEC uh, called the Center for Risk and Quantitative Analysis, which is using a lot of data analytics. Uh, they have a couple of uh, something that was first called the Accounting Quality Model, and now the Corporate Issuer Risk Assessment Program, which is CIRA, they call it. Um, they uh, look at uh, 110 metrics, uh, and they're doing a lot of uh, dashboard comparisons of company financials against financials of their peer uh, institutions in the same industry to look for anomalies. And uh, they apparently have a word search program that can go through MD&A disclosures and look for um, 
whatever they've identified as suspicious uh, uh, or red flag uh, type discussion in the MDNA. So that's important. And whistleblowers, of course, is a big uh, factor with the SEC. Uh, I think the whistleblower program has succeeded beyond their wildest expectations, um, getting thousands of whistleblower uh, uh, complaints. And uh, Andrew mentioned that about 18% of the uh, whistleblower claims uh, are uh, focused on financial and accounting fraud. So um, I'll throw out a question to Mark, uh, who has served as audit committee chair. Um, this notion that if you find uh, material inaccuracies, that you're going to cease annual and quarterly filings until satisfied with the uh, accuracy that sounds like an action that could generate an awful lot of heat. Um, I've seen situations where uh, financials which are held back for uh, even a couple of months can lead to substantial uh, uh, losses in the stock market and even one situation where a company wound up being delisted for a while until they could get their financials under control. So as an audit committee chair, in your companies where you serve, do you feel that the audit committee charter gives you the sign-off authority to, to block the filing of the financials if you're unhappy with them? Uh, absolutely. Yeah, I, I have, <clears throat> we have a, a, a firm practice with the different companies where I've been a CFO as well as a, a board member and audit chair that until the internal audit, the external audit, management and the audit committee sign off, nothing gets submitted. So there's a, a check and balance process that we, we've used in different companies uh, to help protect against the accidental filing of sorts. Sure. Another um, question I, I will add that related to that is, you know, if, if we sense something is going to be a, causing a delay or an issue, and, and maybe it's just workload or somebody got sick or whatever, um, you know, we, we, we want to be very careful not to file and then have to clean up. I'd rather delay rather than file and clean up afterwards. And, and to that extent, uh, before we have audit committee meetings, I usually have separate uh, calls with both internal audit and separately with the external audit uh, people to get their assessment of how things are going, uh, you know, the how comfortable the, the audit firm is in the process of having their internal reviews done so that there aren't any surprises when we get to an audit committee meeting. Great. Let me, let me ask you a related question. So with the filings, uh, you need CEO and CFO uh, certificates uh, to be filed with the SEC. And apparently many companies are using kind of a sub-certificate uh, type process uh, where people who are reporting up the chain to the CEO and the CFO are also signing internal uh, certificates uh, attesting to the accuracy of the work that they've done. Is that a practice that uh, that your companies use? Yes, I, I would consider that to be a, call it a best practice, where uh, in, in a, we have sub-certifications the, for the major business units where the the business unit general manager and controller go through a four or five, six page questionnaire and answer the questions regarding what happened during the quarter, you know, uh, special transactions, uh, potential litigation, uh, related party activity, you know, co covers all of the disclosure as well as the quantification types of things. Uh, that gets rolled up so that it provides a comfort level for the C CEO and the CFO to sign on behalf of the company. And then just prior to the filing, another best practice is to have a, a disclosure committee meeting with the company officers and the, and the lead business unit managers to make sure that anything that might potentially be a subsequent event that has to be disclosed is included in the filing. Do you go below the controller level? I'm thinking of the WorldCom case where there were some uh, uh, staff accountants in WorldCom that were 
recording. Uh, I think they were capitalizing instead of expensing some significant uh, expenditures and uh, wound up being very important witnesses in the government case. Uh, how far down do you go to, with these sub-certificates? Uh, just to the, to the manager level. And then we have internal audit that is in the weeds with the staff accountants and the um, you know accounting people to check and balance their work. You know, another best practice is to have a separate code of ethics for finance people uh, over and above, which gets into a little bit more detail than the overall company code of ethics would have. And, and it relates Great. to the specifics of approving journal entries and uh, account analysis and that kind of thing. Okay, I'm now going to turn it over to Jennifer, who's going to lead us through uh, a discussion of the uh, new uh, revenue recognition rule, which becomes effective for the financial statements uh, covering 2018. But we're already in the transition period, if you will, because the prior year uh, reports have to, in uh, one way or another, uh, comply or be shown in a pro forma what the differences would be. So, Jennifer, why don't you pick it up and lead us through the new rule? Okay, great. Thanks, Frank. Um, so, not that there isn't enough focus on revenue recognition to begin with, and there will continue to always be a lot of focus on revenue recognition. We're now going through a Wholesale, wholesale change in the accounting standard for revenue recognition. Um, Haley, well, you can advance slide, to Haley. slide six. Yeah, sorry. Um, so currently, revenue recognition is covered by um, topic 605 in the um, codification. Um, 605 will be wiped out and will be replaced with um, ASC 606. Um, we are moving to a five-step um, recognition process under the new standard. The five steps are, are listed here. <clears throat> I'm not going to go through these with you. Um, we're not going to have a class on revenue recognition or accounting for revenue. That would be uh, probably a little bit painful and certainly longer than we have time for here today. Um, the key takeaway um, is really that this is a wholesale change for the organization in the context of um, looking at all of your contracts with customers and getting a, a, a clean understanding of what the performance obligations are, what the transaction price is for those performance uh, obligations, how that gets allocated, and then, and then when we are recognizing revenue. Um, this will require far more judgment than um, exists in, in the current revenue recognition standard and will require um, far more disclosure than we have seen in the past with respect to um, revenue recognition. And that's really the result of the more judgment. Um, this is the result of a joint project between the FASB and the IASB. It is a more principles-based standard than we have seen in US GAAP previously, um, which aligns a little bit more um, with the way standards are developed at the international level. Um, I've in, provided in the um, documents um, that are attached in the presentation are the firm's most recent bulletins on um, the revenue recognition. The, the primary bulletin is the new development summary that's titled a shift in the top line that sort of go through, goes through in detail the five-step model. Um, it's NDS 2014-06. There's also a joint transition resource group that meets periodically. They're referred to as the TRG. I believe they're up to sort of memo 54 or 55 at this point that are covering a number of transition matters and guidance, um, and the, some of those bulletins are on that. As many of you recall, about a year ago, the, um, they did extend the deadline for implementation of this by one year, but um, for those of you who are hoping for yet another extension, there will not be another deferral. Um, the, TRG, the TRG, the FASB, and the IASB are not having any conversations about any further delays. So if you're not working on this, you need to get started working on this. Um, Haley, if you want to advance to the next slide, 
Um, this let me just you ask you, Jennifer, let me ask you a question on that score. Just last month, uh, the SEC chief accountant uh, in a speech uh, expressed concern that in a recent survey, 75% of the company respondents had not completed their initial assessment and 25% had not begun their assessment. And he uh, expressed the concern that uh, but the amount of work that's going to be required going through every contract and applying these five steps, designing new systems, processes, and controls, and then collaterally uh, looking at the impact on information systems and business processes, how the change in revenue recognition might affect the timing of the recognition of revenue, which could impact compensation, bonuses, contractual arrangements, loan covenants, tax planning. So uh, what's the attitude of your firm in terms of uh, – I, I, I'm sensing or hearing that there's been some pushback from uh, the clients saying, well, we don't really need to start this yet. You know, this just looks like sort of a churning exercise by the auditing firms to generate more revenues. But – uh, that's why I reference the SEC chief accountant. He's, he doesn't have a, a financial stake in this, but he does have a stake in making sure that it's done right. Um, you know, that's consistent with what, um, you know, as a firm, we have concerns at that same level. You know, as we're seeing, um, we're in the sort of back end of the 10K filing season. Most or all of the 1231s are filed now, and we are still seeing – you know, people adding in their disclosure that they don't yet know the impact of the um, the oncoming change in accounting principle, and, and that is concerning. Um, you're correct, Frank, that this is a wholesale change for the organization, and as a result, numerous parties need to um, be involved in the process and understand how revenue recognition may change. I think there's a little bit of, um, you know, a, a company that I would call ship and bill, right? So they, they, they basically ship a product, bill their customer, and recognize revenue. It's a pretty straightforward process. Today, I think that they're naively living in a land of it's not going to change, but they really do need to go back and do some analysis about whether they have minimum buys, minimum sell, how they're working with distributors, so it's a much deeper analysis than maybe one thinks. You know, I think companies who are in complicated revenue recognition scenarios today in the technology space or in the software space are looking at this in more detail than probably, say, the average ship and bill. But the ship and bill needs to sort of get, get on the bus, if you would say, and really start looking at this because it's going to be a lot of work. And I think you're seeing more and more you know, whether it's webinars or roundtable discussions that the accounting firms are, are working on and um, trying to get people really focused on this. Yeah, in addition to software and technology, um, the chief accountant mentioned construction and real estate um, um, have some specialized rules, uh, completion, uh, accounting, and, and the like that may be changing uh, because a lot of the – all of the current guidance, including things like SAB 101 – uh, are going to be uh, eliminated, and yeah. all of the practices will be under this rule. <laughs> exactly. And, and you know, one of the things, um, you know, this the current slide that's up here talks a little bit about some of the disclosure requirements, but um, if you move to slide eight, you know, there is the, a full elimination of industry-specific revenue recognition rules. So um, that's all going to change, so those industries will have that much more work. Um, as you mentioned before, Frank, there are, you know, sort of two different transition ways. Um, you can apply what is called the full retrospective method, and that is um, in 2018, you will present 17 and 16 as though they were following the new standard. So we're already into 16 where you would potentially be um, dual tracking right, some sort of dual tracking of revenue recognition because we're still following 605 today. But come 2018, you would then have to re reflect 16 and 17 consistent with 18. So that's the full retrospective 
um, method. Then we have this modified retrospective, which basically says we're going to apply this update 1118 with an accumulate with a cumulative um, effect adjustment to opening retained earnings, and then disclose what the impact would have been on 16 and 17. So regardless of which uh, method you select, you still need to know how it impacts 16 and 17. So we're already in 16, right? As you point out, Frank, there's work to be done. Yeah, the concern I think that some people have is that uh, this rule, because it's principles-based and not rules-based, uh, has built into it more judgment calls, more estimates, and there's a concern that with the level, if you're having to apply this to every single contract that you have, um, there could be information that's lost in the shuffle if you don't start this process until 2018, uh, and then you have to go back and try to apply these standards to all your contracts that were in existence in 2016 and 2017, that you could wind up with some gaps. Just uh, yeah. And that's a, lost, if you will. Yeah, and that's a huge risk. And then, and then imagine, um, you know, public companies are then also required to do their own assessment of internal control. And then for those that are subject to the audit requirement, have the internal control audited. So now, what about all the con processes and controls around revenue recognition in the old and the new, and running the sort of parallel systems? and managing the process of a change in accounting principle and the processes and controls and involvement at that level. So as you can see, it, it becomes this sort of, you know, almost um, scary endeavor, but if the longer you wait, the worse it's going to get, right? Yeah, the, the chief accountant uh, and the chairman and the, the head of enforcement have all been saying that uh, they anticipate that internal controls are going to have to be revised with with regard to revenue recognition. And, oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah. So there's too, no way they're not going long. to be revised. Yeah. And and the the other point, you know, on this idea of estimate, more that yes, you're right. More estimates, more judgment, more disclosure. And remember that auditing estimates is that much harder than auditing things that are objective and clear, right? So you've got to be working hand-in-hand -hand with your auditors and the process and, and how those estimates are being backed up by, you know, whatever the inputs are to those estimates. Maybe we should go back to the disclosure slide because there's some important issues there that we skipped over. Okay, so if we want to go back to slide seven. Um, so the disclosure slide here, you know, lays out the different requirements. Um, you know, some of the first two items are sort of things that are already required today. Um, three and four are, are new, particularly four, um, significant judgments, changes in the judgments, and, and how those were applied in recognizing contracts and how they may have changed from year to year. So you're going to certainly be providing more information. And if you think about... Um, you know, those situations where you have goodwill and you're testing goodwill for impairment every year, think about all the disclosures you have around those estimates and the inputs to how you determine the fair value of reporting um, units and how that all got. So that, that, that idea is going to translate into your revenue disclosures today. Yeah, well, I don't think number three is any piece of cake either because the no. performance rules are – are changed and right. uh, there's questions about timing. Um, uh, for example, licensing um, is extremely complicated into this new rule in terms of uh, when the license is uh, effective and when when the revenue is earned. And uh, there's also a significant question on transactions as to whether you have one performance or multiple performances and whether you aggregate them or don't aggregate them and what the timing is. So those seem to be very tricky questions compared to yeah. current. Yeah. Determining the performance obligations, you know, is, is probably one of the more complicated um, sections of the five-step model. Um, you know, never mind that you then have to allocate the transaction price, but determining what those obligations are and whether they're um, whether they can be aggregated, as you point out, are all things that will require a 
significant amount of judgment and involvement with a number of people, and in some cases may require you to, you know, work with your customer in determining how those things will lay out in future purchase orders or contracts or things like that. Um, but yeah, this is, you know, like I said when I when we sort of started talking about 606, you could dedicate hours and hours to um, how this is going to work and how an entity might think about working through the transition, um, you know, and then think about even the complexities of in a global organization, the contracting process and how that happens country by country and whether there are unique aspects in different countries that could impact how this works country by country, business unit by business unit. Yeah, so it's a, a, a very um, complicated and detailed uh, process. Mark, what are the uh, what are the insights from the audit committee perspective? Uh, um, are your companies starting to get ready for this rule? Yeah, I think the uh, it's, it, it is a big deal, <laughs> and and Jennifer mentioned something about it. It couldn't get any worse. Well, at the same time, accounting departments need to are going to need to deal with a new leasing rule which isn't the subject of this discussion, but keep in mind that your your CFO and their staff organizations are going to be wrestling with RevRec at the same time they're dealing with a leasing standard change, which deals with what operating leases the company may have and how they get classified. But I think the, the so what in terms of recommendations for an audit committee would be, number one, uh, have a continuing education update with your external audit firm on the new accounting standards and how they apply to the company or your clients that you're that you're working with. Uh, the second one would be that you know there needs to be a work plan laying out the tasks over the you know the, over the next year to take a look at uh, cu customer contracts, sales, and bonuses. Uh, IT is probably the longest lead time item, and in, in many companies, invoicing tends to be a little bit customized, even in off the, even with off-the-shelf kind of packages. And there may be uh, plug-in modules in the IT system, like sales tax or some other aspect of uh, shipping or whatever that uh, that may need to be updated as well. Uh, certainly, the controls, the business model, uh, and last but not least, the the way the company uh, has may have to inter interpret or revisit bank covenants uh, may need to be something that's thought through ahead of time, uh, because it, because whether it's with the revenue wreck or with the other leasing issue, you know there may be an impact on on bank covenants and the and the way they're calculated. But I think number the overall goal would be that for the company to have a work plan that's been thought out and to have an an owner in the in the accounting organization that is going to be accountable to keep the CFO and the audit committee current on the status of implementation and and it can't start soon enough because as Jennifer mentioned you know 2016 is going to need to be analyzed to determine what the impact is regardless of whether the numbers are restated or whether a cumulative impact is calculated. Yes. So I give an advanced plug. I think we're going to plan on covering the leasing rule at our live uh, event in Chicago in November. So in the audit committee hot topics roundtable. So uh, with that being said, let's move on to uh, um, slide number nine. We'll move over into the next topic, which is related party transactions. Um, so. Uh, I'll go quickly through this slide. It's important. Uh, PCLB AOB uh, came out with audit standard number 18, uh, which uh, rewrote its uh, uh, auditing practices on related parties. Um, it's been looking at this for well over five years, and I think uh, identified in the uh, update that a number of the largest financial reporting frauds in U.S. history oftentimes involved related party uh, transactions. Uh, we see that uh, related party disclosure issues appear in about 20% of the SEC in enforcement and private litigation accounting cases. So let's move to the next slide. 
So I'm not going to go through this uh, slide in excruciating detail. Um, this is derived from a study that four accounting professors put together at, uh, about 2007 and 2008 where they looked extensively at SEC enforcement actions and then they drilled down into SEC actions where related party disclosures uh, were important and they very systematically uh, divided uh, the matters into these four categories. Um, uh, the first one is sales and purchases uh, from related parties. Um, the second big category is asset sales and purchases from related parties. The third big category is borrowings from or loans to related parties. And the last quarter category is investments in or sale of equity stake to related parties. Now there are a lot of related party transactions that happen on a day-to-day -day basis that uh, are just part of the ordinary course of business. Um, but uh, there is the possibility of uh, transactions either impacting uh, revenue uh, or assets and liabilities. Uh, and in the more egregious types of transactions can lead to uh, misappropriation and embezzlement of corporate assets, uh, which is why uh, the auditing rules uh, unrelated parties uh, exist. So with that sort of introduction, uh, why don't we pass it to uh, Jennifer to cover, we're going to skip back and forth between Jennifer and Mark on the next sequence. So we'll start with slide 11 for Jennifer. Okay. Thank you, Frank. Um, so the PCAOB came out with PCAOB auditing standard number 18. And, and this covers the, the the audit of related parties, um, significant unusual transactions, and financial relationships and transactions with executives. Um, you can go ahead and advance the next slide. Um, you know, as Mar as um, Frank pointed out, there have been a number the the PCAOB has been very focused on um, related parties in recent years, particularly the audit procedures over related parties. And, um, you know, we've seen that through the inspection process, and I suspect we will continue to see significant activity. You know, they've focused on our revenue testing for years and years and years, and now now we're moving on to the next hot topic, which is going to be um, related parties. But the, um, you know, it starts with a risk assessment process, um, you know, a, which would include obtaining an understanding of the processes, doing lots of inquiries. Um, this will require a lot of communication with the audit committee and the board and how they identify, track, and uh, monitor related parties and transactions with related parties. So there should be an expectation that there will be um, more inquiry and more um, audit procedures with those levels of individuals in the organization, um, in, in particularly focused on the internal controls surrounding related parties. Um, and if you think about, uh, you know, as we go through that process, if the auditors identify then previously undisclosed related parties, that will then sort of open up the Pandora's box of additional work and focus on um, the risks associated with that. Um, I think the next slide 13, Mark, I'm going to turn it over to you on that one. Oh, thank you, Mark. Sorry, let me ask Jennifer. Um, in reading the the uh, the audit standard and the uh, explanation, you get I get a strong sense that um, the uh, undisclosed uh, related party uh, transactions, particularly if they involve uh, uh, significant uh, uh, transactions, uh, unusual transactions have a you know def they're definitely telling auditors to have their antenna antennae up and pretty much require that if you come across something that hasn't been disclosed to you as an auditor that you have to go through uh, in rather extensive detail trying to understand why did this not get disclosed what's the 
purpose of the transaction and those sorts of things. Do you get that sense, Jennifer? Um, absolutely. And, you know, it, it becomes almost sort of one of those presumptions of a material weakness in the environment, right? So you have that, that piece of the internal control because what where is the breakdown in the, the processes and controls in terms of how those relationships are identified and then monitored? So when you find one that you didn't know about or that management didn't know about, you got to kind of take, take a step back and say, well, why didn't anybody know about this? Um, you know, and I think this is going to become particularly complicated when you think about um, interlocking boards, right, and how um, different – how board members sit across companies and whether those companies are doing products and services for other companies. You know, the, the challenge becomes, you know, how do you identify all of the related parties and then how do we then make sure that that list is complete and when you come across something that indicates that the list is not complete, then you've got to kind of go back to the beginning of the process, right? Yes, I practice in the Bay Area, and of course, uh, with the venture capital community here and the companies that are starting out small and then some of them getting big, um, become public companies, and um, oftentimes uh, you have VC uh, partners on boards, um, and uh, it's easy to have, you have to really kind of look at the interlocks to uh, make sure that uh, uh, there's, uh, that the related party transactions are, you know, being surfaced and examined and, and the like. And so that's a key feature out here where we have so many interlocking boards. Anyway, uh, Mark, you're going to pick it up with how do you find these things? Yeah, I was going to offer that the, in my mind anyway, this process of, of related parties and disclosure it you know, starts with having an overall ethics policy in place that's recertified annually by officers, directors, as well as uh, key managers in the in the company. And it it can uh, one additional uh, in addition to the quarterly disclosure checklist and disclosure committee reviews, uh, another way of identifying these things or getting them highlighted is in an, an annual proxy questionnaire that goes to officers and directors because oftentimes uh, the, the questions will relate to uh, specific related party kinds of activities that may have popped up. Sometimes these things can be accidental uh, and give the people the benefit of the doubt, but there are, there are numerous checkpoints between ethics policy certification, proxy disclosure, as well as the quarterly disclosure committee reviews that, that can be used to highlight categories that may or, that may be related and have to have some kind of disclosure. So it's a it's an ongoing process for a company, much like monitoring and and providing oversight for the FCPA or other uh, you know public governance type practices. So this just happens to be one that. Uh, is a hot button with the SEC, and it requires us to spend a little more time on it. Sure. The uh, I've I've heard that some companies, in the wake of the TCAOB uh, emphasis on this this year, um, are working with their auditors to tighten up uh, or ask more questions in their uh, director and management uh, questionnaires that they usually are sending out at least annually and most and more often than not quarterly. Is that something that you guys are looking at? Uh, we've historically relied on our law firm to make sure that our questionnaires are compliant with you know, legal proxy-related disclosures as well as uh, <clears throat> You know items that we would want in the footnotes. So, in general, Jennifer, the audit firms haven't been that active in, in the proxy review process. Maybe that's going to change, but uh, in, in my, my my experience is that having the law firm be a source of expertise to to keep a company focused. Yeah, I think you'll see. You know, the proxy. You know, you're right, Mark. We're we're not typically heavily involved in the, the review of the proxy. Um, but I think you'll see more of that going forward because it becomes yet another 
sort of mark of identifying, you know, the who's who and what the potential related parties could be with respect to this. Um, so I think you'll start to see see more a little bit more focus um, in this area on that front. Particularly with the PCAOB <laughs> inspection right. process. <laughs> right, right, right. And, 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 you know, I would be remiss if I didn't tell you that, you know, when the PCAOB inspects an engagement, they've read probably every single filing that the company has made in the last 24 months in detail. And, you know, if they find something in the proxy that we didn't necessarily consider, they're going to ask us about it, right? <laughs> um, so you can expect, you know, a, a lot more focus in this area from the auditors, and, um, you know, that will be an evolving process. And I'm sure as we go through the inspection process with the with the PCAOB that those those procedures will, you know, evolve as our procedures have evolved on revenue testing, as many of you are probably familiar. The PCOB has a lot of influence over uh, an auditor's uh, right to continue uh, being an auditor, so uh, it's a strong stick that they have over the audit profession, and uh, particularly when they put so much emphasis on a new auditing standard like this, um, you, you, you can expect that the inspections uh, will be looking at uh, uh, this year's uh, related party work. and. I think as Jennifer pointed out to me at one point, uh, they put out a new rule, the, audit, the auditors uh, do the best they can, uh, and then they find out if they were covering the topics that the PCAOB had in mind. Right, yes, that's a good way to, yeah, that's why I say our procedures will evolve over a period of time. <laughs> they get smarter, uh, we get smarter, everybody gets smarter. <laughs> yeah, Mark, number uh, slide 14 has... Uh, some of the kinds of things that uh, uh, the uh, standard is telling the auditors to look for. And there, of course, depending on uh, you as the audit committee to um, and the management to provide them with this type of information so that they can work through their, uh, work through their materials. Yeah, and these, and these kind of questions are generally part of a a proxy disclosure checklist that officers and directors fill out. Uh, if, if there's details regarding operating management that surface during the course of a quarterly disclosure checklist review, then we can probe down and ask for these additional kinds of details to be to be provided. Okay. Um, why don't we throw it back to Jennifer for the next couple of slides? Um, which involves significant unusual transactions, and then the uh, what the uh, standard uh, asks them to look for in terms of executive compensation and bonuses. Right. So, so when we talk about significant and unusual transactions, you know, these are things like business combinations, um, uh, discontinued ops, you know, a, a, a disposition of a business, um, those types of um, transactions that are out of the everyday normal course of business. Um, you know, we're seeing a lot of focus from the PCAOB on how we audit those transactions, but also how the internal controls around these uh, transactions have been um, established and or followed. What are the processes and controls? Um, you know, if I use a business combination as a good example, um, <clears throat> a lot of people think about the internal control process as saying, well, we've got a one-year deferral, right? We made an acquisition and that, that entity can be scoped out for one year. But, you know, what's not scoped out is the process of actually doing the accounting for the purchase accounting and that unusual transaction in that year and what are all of the things that go into that. But, you know, this gets, it's sort of tangentially related to related parties in the context of what is the business purpose of the transaction? Did we enter into it to engage in any kind of, you know, crazy financial reporting fraud, fraud or to conce conceal some misappropriation of assets? Um, you know, business combination obviously wouldn't be an indicator of that, but if you entered into some sort of 
special purpose transaction that resulted in you spinning off a big piece of the business where you actually might still be obligated. Those are the types of things that they're looking for. So you, you can see continued focus on these things, but um, sort of carving them out as individual sort of what we call significant risks or things to be focused on. Um, if we want to advance to the next slide, um, we're talking about executive comp. Um, this is really getting into understanding how the executive comp arrangements fit into the overall context of, of what our risks are in the audit. Um, I it, think we're it, getting behind in our slides. Haley, you need to go to slide 16. Yeah, it's on 16 on mine. So I. Okay, I'm on 14 on mine. Let me just see if I can okay. advance to 15. Okay, so 16. Good. Um, there we go. So, um, you know, this is sort of put, putting the auditors in the position of making sure that we understand how executive con compensation aligns with the potential risks in the business. Um, so if, for instance, um, let's say an impairment review on goodwill, um, as the potential to result in a significant impairment charge, and if executive compensation is tied to the net result, then there might be some bias in that process um, in the context of ensuring that they can still get their executive comp without an impairment charge, that type of thing. Um, so I think you'll see continued focus and, and expanded focus on reading employment and compensation contracts, understanding how those um, incentive compensation arrangements may fit into the risks in the context of the audit, so that you know it's an ongoing evolution of, of what we focus on and what the risks are in the audit. And it's all tied to the related parties. <laughs> right. What I found interesting was to uh, you have a compensation committee on every board, and they're primarily focused on compensation issues. And here the PCAOB is essentially asking the auditors to look at the executive compensation agreements and uh, managerial bonuses and the like, um, and then uh, primarily looking for risk factors, but sort of putting it into the purview of then reporting up to the audit committee. Um, so it's not really clear um, from the uh, uh, guidance embodied in the rule uh, what the expectation is. Uh, they're right. not asking you to audit the level of compensation or do anything. In, with, no, with, you know. yeah. Because it's less about whether the compensation is right. I mean, that's obviously important. This is really more focused on what does the compensation, how is the compensation arrangement constructed and what risks does that then present to the organization in the context of overall financial reporting and the results and how do we then... Um, identify those risks in the audit and then address those risks through our audit procedures. So, you know, if, if, if management's compensation is tied to results, then they inherently have an incentive to make results better. And, and how can they then do that? And then how do we focus on ensuring that they haven't done something to make results better that isn't just the result of results actually being better, right? Mark, were you going to say something? Right. Right. I, would, I would add that the audit committee and the comp committee are joined at the hip because in many cases uh, there will be metrics that the comp committee determines uh, are benchmarks for bonus thresholds and compensation, well, those such as cash flow. Well, the audit committee <laughs> gets involved by helping the, uh, the comp committee determine how cash flow is calculated, which I, which items are included or excluded because there's you know there's numerous ways to to do something like that. So there there is a close tie in between the work of the two committees. Okay. And uh if we look at uh the next uh slide seventeen Mine's not advancing, so let me advance mine on my screen here. Okay, um, the uh, the auditing standard does not change the definition of what is a related party or the disclosure rules. Um, uh, there's probably a, 
a simple way of looking at related parties in a more complicated way. Um, and the disclosure aspects are all laid out uh, in ASC 815 and item 404A of SEC Regulation SK. So we'll move to the next slide then. And uh looks like we're on something that uh, we have to do with Haley. Um, yep. There's a... at this, yeah. At this time, I'm going to read the CLE code for this program. If you are in need of CLE credit today, please enter this five-digit code into the poll question on the screen after it's announced and press the Submit button. The code is S X N N. Four. Again, Say it again. That is the letter S, as in Sam. The letter X, as in X-ray. The letter N, as in November. The letter N, as in November. The number four. S, X, N, N, four. Again, if you're seeking CLE credit for this session, please complete the polling question by entering the code that was just announced. The polling question will remain open briefly. For those seeking Kansas, New York, and New Jersey CLE credit, in addition to this polling question, you will need to complete the attorney affirmation form and return it immediately following the program. A copy of this form can be found in the resource list widget. And at this time, the poll is now closed. Okay, I'm gonna then, uh, with our last uh, four minutes, uh, talk about internal controls, which we've been talking about quite a bit during the uh, scope of uh, discussion, so that's why we didn't devote as much time to this. Uh, internal controls uh, are required uh, in the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. Uh, SOX 404A uh, requires management reporting and certification of ICFR, internal control over financial uh, reporting. Uh, SOX 404B and the JOBS Act require an audit of the internal controls five years after an IPO or $1 billion in annual revenue or $700 million of market cap. And the COSO framework, um, uh, which was updated in 2013, must be followed. It provides uh, 17 principles uh, to be uh, to be adopted and utilized, and really strongly emphasizes the board's role in overseeing uh, the internal controls and risk assessment, and in particular uh, management override of internal controls. So the last slide, um, just talking about enforcement issues, as I mentioned earlier. Um, the chairman, uh, chairperson, I should say, Mary Jo White, uh, the director of enforcement, Andrew Ceresny, and the uh, chief accountant, Mr. Schnur, I think is his name, have all been uh, give give speeches uh, uh, often, and uh, are they're a good indicator of what the SEC is thinking about and worrying about, and they've been uh, strongly beating the drum about the internal controls. Uh, of course, there's a lot of pushback, as everybody knows, from the Chamber of Commerce on the uh, on the audit requirement, uh, saying that it's expensive for small companies, which is partly why the Jobs Act um, created a new category of emerging growth companies uh, to relax the standards a little bit. Um, the uh, recent uh, FC, uh, SEC enforcement cases, they've brought cases this year against Aquin Financial Control Corp, Magnum Hunter Resources, um, uh, St. Joe Company, Home Loan Servicing Solutions, and last year against Polycom and Steinmark to uh, make their point. Uh, interestingly, we see that um, when we look at class action securities cases um, on accounting issues, 65% of the matters cite material weakness in internal controls. Um, not surprisingly, only, only about half of those were ones where there was actually a material weakness letter uh, or a material weakness disclosure by the company, and the other half um, are the plaintiff's allegation that they see something wrong that happened and that it had to be the function of material weakness. It has a couple of advantages to bring those kinds of allegations to the plaintiffs in that um, it uh, 
uh, because uh, under Delaware law, the directors have a duty uh, to have internal controls that enables them to bring state law claims such as breach of fiduciary duty, uh, negligence, that uh, for one thing, since they don't know at the outset what the DNO insurance might or might not cover, whether there's a securities uh, writer or not, uh, enables them to make sure they're within the scope of the DNO coverage and also gives them an avenue to file derivative claims if they feel that's important. So it's an important topic, and uh, I guess I'll give the last – well, I see we're right at 11. So I think we're at the end, Haley. Should we cut it off right now, or do we do we have more time to go? Um, if there's any questions and answers you want to address. Uh, I don't see any. All right. Then this wraps up our web conference today. We invite you to contact any of today's speakers if you have additional questions or would like more information on their particular topics. Just a reminder, today's program is being recorded and will be available on Foley's website in the next few days. At the conclusion of this program, a questionnaire will appear. Please take a minute or two to give us your feedback about the presentation today. It is important to to us to know your thoughts and helps us shape our programs going forward. If you have any questions regarding CLE credit for this program, please contact Haley Musgrave at hmusgrave at foley.com. As a reminder, CLE processing takes approximately eight weeks. Eligible participants will receive their certificates of attendance via email at that time. Thank you again for your participation.